Given how flashy some heroes can get with their skill sets, I think it's hard for new players to understand just how devastating a good Rubik can be. At first glance, a standard disable, nuke, and passive doesn't seem like much, but once you've witnessed firsthand how the ability to steal a spell can turn a teamfight around, it becomes clear why he is known as the Grand Magus. What wonders will we see today? Why, it's the history of Rubik. Rubik's first skill is Telekinesis, a two-part spell that first lifts a primary target and then drops him somewhere in a spot of your choice within a certain range. Lifted units are counted as being stunned, although I would argue that this is more powerful just because it forces the enemies to do a fun little wiggle in the air. The area where the target gets dropped will stun any enemies and a small AoE. Fade Bolt is a nuke that bounces from enemy to enemy, dealing magical damage and reducing their attack damage for a short duration. The number of bounces are infinite, but each enemy can only be damaged once, and the damage is reduced by a certain percentage over each bounce. Null Field is a passive AoE ability that increases allied magic resistance, and as a 7.07, .07, it can be toggled to reduce enemy's magic resistance. Spell Steal is Rubik's ultimate and signature ability, allowing him to pirate the last spell an enemy hero used for a few minutes or until he dies. There are a whole ton of rules regarding which spells he can steal, but generally you can't take passives, item abilities, or active attack modifiers, and also Walrus Kick for some reason. Each spell stolen this way also has an instant cast time, so if you're able to steal something from a hero like Earthshaker or Omni Knight, watch them cower in emasculation as you do their job way better than they ever could. Rubik found his way into Dota on April 27, 2011 on patch 6.72. He uses Medivh's character model, which is also what Maverick the Gambler used before he was forever sent to Dota Purgatory for being an annoying dick. But that's a story for another episode. Given that his initial release and his introduction into Dota 2 are only 14 months apart, there isn't much to talk about in terms of old abilities or balance changes. The two Rubiks are generally more or less the same, aside of a few key mechanical restrictions and differences in their overall characters. In his original lore, Rubik is explicitly stated to be the son of Aghanim, implying that he was destined for greatness as a mage. His background mentions that he performed for crowds using his telekinesis while also fighting off wizards who would challenge him with relative ease, outsmarting and stealing their own spells to use against them. Despite the fact that Rubik liked to flex on and trivialize his opponents, he actually had a few restrictions on which spells he could steal. Due to engine limitations, Rubik couldn't steal any transformation spells like Shapeshift from Lycan or Elder Dragon Form from Dragon Knight. However, this also includes less apparent transformations like Firefly, Arctic Burn, or Split Shot. And you know what? This is fine. We like you for who you are, Rubik. The Grand Magus also had a list of spells due to engine errors or coding conflicts which couldn't be stolen. And here they are. Sub-abilities, attack modifiers, and passives also couldn't be stolen just kind of as a rule, but the restrictions I find most interesting revolve around the legacy hotkeys. Rubik's spells have hotkeys of X for Telekinesis, Z for Fade Bolt, and Q for Spell Steal. Because of this, any spell that has these hotkeys could not be stolen. Fortunately, this list isn't too big, but it really does make you think when you look back on it. Rubik was actually able to spell steal cheese and the lowest level of BKB due to how they were programmed, but this was quickly fixed in 6.72b. 6.72c reduced Fade Bolt's bounce radius from 600 to 500, 6.73 reduced the Telekinesis mana cost from 160 to 120, and both Fade Bolt's mana cost and cooldown were increased. Life was indeed difficult for the son of Aghanim, but things would look up soon. Rubik nabbed a spot in Dota 2's roster on June 20th, 2012, and Valve decided to make some, uh, changes. It seems as though Rubik moved to San Francisco to find himself, and we ended up with a very different interpretation of the character, both in visual appearance as well as personality. Here, the lore establishes the concept of Maguses, a high-level class of mage that can only be appointed through a hidden council. Similar to the Dota 1 background, this piece of lore also highlights Rubik's endless talents and further elaborates on how he uses tricks to confuse his opponents. He achieved the title of Grand Magus after a chain of events led to him killing a whole lot of Maguses through means of deception and skill. In contrast to his affinity for murder throughout his story, Rubik's voice lines present him as whimsical and curious to the world around him, if not somewhat arrogant about his own abilities. Such fascinating energies. Mm, that don't be a bit. Your attempt was pathetic. Here, not a lot of explanation is provided as to why Rubik can steal spells, outside of a line that mentions he subtly reads and replicates his enemy's powers, and the spell description mentioning that he studies the trace magical elements in the air. From this, along with the fact that he wears a mask, I have concluded that Rubik is actually Obito Uchiha and is using the Sharingan to fight his enemies. Rubik's responses provide a good deal of insight into the world that is Dota 2. Most notably, his interactions with Invoker reveal to us a couple of things. Invoker now, eh? No longer the Arsenal Magus. 
One, Invoker for a time in his life was known as the Arsenal Magus before abandoning the title, probably due to his own inflated sense of self. And two, that each Magus had an adjective associated with their abilities. The fact that Rubik was bestowed the adjective Grand speaks a lot to his relative strength compared to the other heroes. Rubik also mentions that Lich could have been a powerful Magus in his lifetime, although I suspect that Lich may have been happier with the whole enslaving kingdoms thing he was doing. Had you chosen to live, Lich, what a Magus you could have been. In terms of changes, 6.75 hit Rubik by reducing his move speed by 10 and reducing the Fade Bolt bounce radius yet again from 500 to 440. In 6.76, Fade Bolt's damage was reduced at all levels. When you read things like this, it really is difficult to be a position 5 main sometimes. In 6.79, the cooldown of Telekinesis was increased from 18 to 22, although the first ray of hope for Rubik players came in the form of his first Aghanim Scepter upgrade. This reduces Spell Steel's cooldown to 5 at all levels, increases its cast range from 1000 to 1400, and any stolen spell that is capable capable of having an Aghanim's upgrade will have it applied. As a trade-off, Rubik won't be able to steal an upgraded form of a spell in the case that his enemy has an Aghanim Scepter, and he doesn't. 6.81 was Dota 2's first spring cleaning patch, and although there is no documentation of this, Rubik's ability to cliff enemies using telekinesis was greatly hindered. You could still do it by clicking on very specific spots of the cliff, thus putting the bad enemy carry in timeout, but overall the cliffs were made unclickable when you chose where the enemies were going to land. I do recognize this mechanic as being unfun for anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in the early game, but it was also a big part of Rubik's gameplay and I was sad for a while to see it go. In 6.83, Fade Bolt's mana cost was reduced, the Aghanim's upgrade reduced spell steals cooldown from 5 to 2, and stolen spell cooldowns were no longer refreshed if there were spells stolen in between. 6.84 made it so that Null Field also affects creeps, which makes it slightly more annoying to push against an enemy Rubik. Rubik's 7.00 talents weren't anything too special, and all of them merely enhance his existing gameplay rather than drastically affecting it when he picks something up. In 7.07, .07, a few notable changes occurred. Along with other cliffing abilities, Telekinesis is once again allowed to throw enemies up onto the cliffs with total disregard for their well-being. Nullfield gained a toggleable form that reduces enemy magic resistance rather than increase your own team's magic resistance, which allows for more versatility in the skill, and if I have to confess a sin right now, I usually keep it on red to farm creep waves. Rubik's talents were also updated in order to affect his active abilities instead of giving him just raw numbers to work with. The most significant of these in my opinion is his level 25 talent which increases spell damage for stolen spells which, of course, led to some cheesy tactics. Now it's weird that Rubik isn't related to Broodmother because he's just so full of bugs. It seems like any time the game receives any kind of major update, the designated intern at Valve in charge of making sure Rubik doesn't single handedly kill the game questions his own life choices just a little bit more. Although not a comprehensive list, Rubik has been known to crash the game for any number of reasons, have his talents change to snipers after stealing shrapnel, having his tempest double use spell steal, turning into an agility hero after stealing morph, losing his spell steal after stealing anything, having his ult replaced by another one, and I'm sure by the time this video comes out, Rubik will be able to multiply all the master balls in your inventory after you find him in Cinnabar Island. Rubik's connection to Aghanim is maintained in this game, and what that exactly means is given a lot more context than before. Rather than stating it outright in his lore, the relationship is revealed through a voice line when he picks up an Aghanim Scepter. Father's a masterpiece. From here, we can make a few inferences based on some descriptions found in the game. Scepter's description tells us that it belongs to a wizard with demigod-like powers, and every hero's lines with it holds the item in high regard, so if it weren't obvious enough already, Aghanim is kind of a big deal. Next, the description for the Scepter of the Grand Magus item tells us that Rubik's ability to copy also extends to Arcane Assembly, although it's not quite at a level that Rubik can be proud of as he laments, Would that I had father skill with construction. The pieces that tie all of these loose threads together come from voice lines by Pangolier and Dark Willow, which suggest that Rubik's talents only pale in comparison to Aghanim, and that his character is troubled by the burden of living up to the expectations set by his father. Rubik, you're no enigma. You're a sad little boy looking for approval. Step out of your father's shadow, Rubik. The world awaits. What was it like living in Aghanim's shadow? It's rare enough for any character or class to have an ability to steal an opponent's skills, but Rubik is able to do it in a game where you can summon a boat, literally not exist, and turn into a giant dog. I think playing as a character that's so carefree in an environment where everyone wants to maim and kill is really refreshing, and his quick cast times make him a pleasure to pick up. This is of course if you can ignore the fact that Rubik has a terribly low win rate despite his relatively high pick rate. But come on, we're not here to be tryhards, we're here to have fun. You do have fun playing Dota, don't you? I'm Dennis the Tall, and that was the history of Rubik.
While I have you here, I wanted to thank everyone for sticking with me so far. I know this came out a little bit later than expected, so all I can hope for is your mercy because I really did miss everyone's nice comments. I also opened up a Twitter account which I'll use to post video updates and interact with everyone a little bit more, so please feel free to follow. Until next time, stay beautiful.